So you can take it, you know, as soon as you're walking in the gym, take it immediately. And I think that's what's going to allow you to perform better, but also allow you to recover. And so there's no need to take anything else with it because we're providing the electrolytes, we're providing the mitochondrial ATP, and we're providing the nitric oxide. Okay, two parts I want to harp on. One was the energy, and two was the mixing it when you go into the gym. Do I mix it with cold water, hot water? What if I put it in Gatorade, so forth, or something with acidity to it? Does that affect the product at all? Yeah, look, acid's going to facilitate the production of nitric oxide, so similar to swallowing it and hitting the acid environment of the stomach. So if you're putting it in something that's acidic like a juice, you want to make sure you take it immediately. Okay. And that's why we developed it as a shot. So you can't put it in 16 ounces of water and then sip on it over the next, you know, half hour or hour. Mm -hmm. As soon as you put it in solution, you got to take it immediately because it starts generating nitric oxide as soon as it hits solution. And really, there's no need to mix it with anything. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Gatorade because it has a lot of sugar in there. Yeah. But it's best just mix it with water, like room temperature okay. water. Mix it in there with a frother or mix it really quickly and then take it as a shot. A frother. A frother. You carry one of those around with you, right? <laughs> Actually, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, now, energy-wise, uh, we were talking about cell- cellular energy with the ATP. Most people, when hearing energy, think caffeine, caffeine. a pump. Are you talking about the same thing or a different type of feeling? Well, energy, from my perspective, as a biochemist and physiologist, is all about the energy currency of the cell. Okay. It's how well the mitochondria are. So if you have, if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, you're never going to have energy. You get fatigue, you get lethargy. So what we try to do at the cellular level or subcellular level is improve energy production. And then energy, to a lot of people, it's, it's all about perception, right? So what is energy? Uh, for me, again, it's the energy currency of the cell, the ability to produce ATP. But energy for a lot of people is... Can I get through the day without being tired? Can I walk up a flight of steps without getting short of breath? And if you're an athlete, it's really how do I get through a two to three hour, you know, whether it's an NBA basketball game or an NFL football game or a baseball game. You know, these are hours that you have to, especially baseball or soccer, for example. I mean, these are really intense types of um, activities. Most people, as you said, think of energy as all these caffeine and these stimulants. Mm-hmm. I mean, caffeine, the, the clinical data on caffeine is, as an ergogenic aid is pretty indisputable. But caffeine's a vasoconstrictor. Yeah. So it, it allows you to have a, a, a perceived less exertion. But energetically and at the cellular level, it's really not providing any source of energy. So what we try to do in, in our NO Beach products is there's no stimulants, there's no caffeine. We're basically improving circulation, improving oxygen delivery, improving mitochondrial function, and improving the energy currency of the cell. And then that'll translate into perceived energy, okay. uh, you know, a, a feeling of kind of well-being. And if you're an athlete, it's certainly going to enhance your performance. Okay. That's interesting. A lot of athletes love to travel to altitude yeah. to train before a UFC fight or, or what have you, right? Um, and typically, they'll go up quite a bit, at, about a month ahead or a yeah. couple weeks ahead and so forth. We've talked in the past and... Um, Nitric oxide plays a big role with oxygen efficiency, right? Yep. So are these athletes consciously, subconsciously, not even realizing that the altitude and training in the altitude is actually increasing their nitric oxide levels, um, which is giving them the benefits of cardiovascular yep. stamina and so forth? Um, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, we published on this in 2007 where we took people that live in Tibet which is at the base of the Himalayas, 12,000 feet above sea level. Hmm. <clears throat> so obviously the partial pressure of oxygen is much lower at altitude. So the question was, how do these people adapt to that low oxygen environment? Because they don't have high altitude pulmonary edema. They're not developing altitude sickness. They live up there and they thrive in that environment. But if we go to altitude, you know, we'll get a headache. You get altitude sickness. If you're really unhealthy, you can develop high altitude pulmonary edema. And sometimes that's fatal. Many times it's fatal. So when athletes go to altitude, you know, so we, we also know that it, the, the kidneys start to induce a, a molecule called erythropoietin. Mm-hmm. Then it induces um, an increase in hematocrit, more red blood cells, more oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, so that's part of the mechanism. But what we discovered is that probably the, the most protective benefits 
of altitude training is you're slowly amping up your ability to produce nitric oxide. So we make them Tibetan-like, right? So when there's less oxygen, you basically have to improve your nitric oxide production mm. to lead to more, more efficient oxygen delivery because with each breath, you're breathing in less oxygen. But these Tibetans, through their adaptive effects and ability to increase their nitric oxide, actually deliver more oxygen per unit time than we living at sea level. So when athletes go there, which are well-trained, have good endothelial function, lower oxygen, the body adapts by increasing nitric oxide. So if you go to you know Colorado or Mexico City, five, 6,000 feet above sea level, and you spend two to three days there, you can see an increase in your nitric oxide production. Okay. And then if you, you know, really do high intensity interval training, less oxygen, you get a better adaptive effects, more nitric oxide being produced. So now when you come back down to sea level, you're like a nitric oxide generating machine, and that's what allows you to outcompete the competition. Right. How long does that last once you get back to sea level to where your body then adapts back? You know, it's probably several days. Um, you know, there's always an adjustment of the human body to its any given environment. Hmm. But that's also important, and so that's what we call environmentally induced hypoxia. Okay. But there's also kind of a pathological induced uh, a hypoxia or ischemia. So if you have COPD or emphysema or coronary artery disease, then your body's compromised in the ability to, to deliver oxygen to those organs, tissues, and cells. So what do we do? We have to increase our nitric oxide production. Okay. But in patients that have endothelial dysfunction, they can't increase their nitric oxide production, so they never get better. Mm. And that's what we do is we basically restore the function of the endothelium. So now the body can adapt to make its own nitric oxide in response to brief periods of hypoxia or ischemia. That's okay. the adaptive effects. So, at your ranch, you have a hyperbaric chamber. Yeah. Does that play the same kind of role? Well, that, that basically improves the saturation of oxygen, dissolved okay. oxygen. Okay. So, we're using high pressure. So, we're basically trying to super oxygenate the tissue. So, in, you know, in patients with concussion or traumatic brain injury or non-healing wounds, we want to oxygenate and improve oxygen delivery. Mm -hmm. And really what we're doing is we're just forcing through high pressure the increased oxygen saturation in solution. We're really not affecting the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin, but it's basically improving the solubility of oxygen through high pressure. But the beauty of that is if you take our nitric oxide, now you're dilating the small blood vessels, mm -hmm. and now you're going to basically enhance delivery of that oxygen through hyperbaric. You know, that's and, and to that point, this is why I asked the question about if you should take pre-workout or yeah. post, right? And depending on if you are doing a four-hour run or so forth, training for a marathon, say your training schedule has a half marathon in it, would it still benefit you to take a nitric oxide product following to really help with the recovery and the delivery of nutrients following? Yeah, well, everything we know about performance and recovery mm -hmm. is dependent upon the blood, the cardiovascular system to take in the nutrients and then get rid of the waste products. Yeah. If you have compromised circulation, you're not only going to get delivery of the nutrients, but you're going to get a buildup of the waste products. So you can't take out the trash, right? So we have to be able to improve nitric oxide production, open up the blood vessels, deliver the good stuff, excrete the wet about metabolic waste material, and then you have great recovery. So it depends upon what type of exercise you're doing in terms of timing of when you take the nitric oxide to improve performance and improve recovery. Okay. Do you ever think you'll make some kind of nitric oxide protein? You know, look, we're always trying to push the envelope and understand human performance and then provide the body what it needs to optimize performance. And we know the data out there on branched chain amino acids and turning on protein synthesis and turning off protein degradation to prevent muscle loss, bone loss, you know, is an important aspect of, of recovering, especially, you know, the older we get, our protein requirements increase. But if we can figure out how to turn off protein degradation and turn on protein synthesis, then that's kind of the metabolic switch.